there in Tucson, Arizona, at the no, in Tucson, Arizona, yeah, at the University of Arizona, on uh, the sixth of December, two thousand and twelve. This is Sonia Colina, who teaches, who works here as a professor of, mm -hmm. of what exactly, Sonia? Of uh, Spanish linguistics. I, I work as a faculty member in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. And uh, so you're not in translation? Uh, per, se, per se, or officially. I'm officially I'm a professor, again, of Spanish linguistics. And I do translation as one of the, my secondary, actually, because I'm generally I'm, I'm a linguist and I do phonetics, phonology, history of the Spanish language, and a few other things having to do with linguistics. But another area is, is translation and translation studies. And I've taught a number of courses, translation here and in other places too, but here um, I've done a course on pedagogy of translation, a graduate okay. level course. Because that's what you're known for mm -hmm. in translation studies. Exactly. Yeah. For, for my work on, for my on work translation on, teaching. Mm -hmm. Trans on translation teaching, yeah. teaching and pedagogy. Yeah. yeah. And I do a few other things in teaching. I've, you know, I've done that some undergraduate courses uh, having to do with business translation, online translation, I've taught medical translation. Uh, we also have come up with through the um, with the assistance of a grant from EBOR, the Arizona Board of Regents, so it's a state grant, we came up with a sequence of courses online, business, medical, uh, legal. Okay, you're, and, you're behind the planning of that? Mm -hmm. I'm behind the plan okay. for that. They're pretty much all the same. We're just taking care of some administrative mm -hmm. issues and enrollment and, and um, uh, online passwords and things like that. Uh, cost and a few other things. And the interesting part about that sequence that's connected to my work on pedagogy is that we're planning on offering it at two different levels. One of them is for people who want to learn how to translate, uh, and another one is for people who are interested in how to teach it. So these people will be observing how these courses work, and at the same time taking an optional additional course that has to do with pedagogy. So that's some of the recent work that I've been doing in terms of teaching. Okay. No. This is, this follows on. We, we know you through your 2003 book on, mm -hmm. on translation um, teaching. What's translation teaching from research to the classroom. Right. And that's one of the big areas that I work with. I'm very interested in getting all that we know through research, all the research findings out there. They're relevant. Some of them are specifically translation studies. Some others are not specifically translation studies and have to do with other areas. Translating those into methodologies okay. and the principal methodology of, of, of translation teaching that then we can use to argue for or against different ways of teaching. Pretty that, much, that's the big thing for me, that in yeah. the United States, I don't think there's very much formal translator training, but there's very little actual research to mm -hmm. connect with, and you seem to be doing yes. that. Yes, that's what I'm interested in, again, because I see that there's a big gap. We have a lot of research and translation studies. Some of it is more or less empirical, mm -hmm. but then you look and see what people are doing in the classroom, and there's a huge gap. Okay, So how do we get the teachers to know all this stuff, to be able to use it? You know, Obviously, they're teachers. They're not researchers, so that doesn't mean some of them could be both, but they don't. Their obligation, their duties are not to do the research, but to be able to use it and, and inform their teaching with the research. So that's what I'm interested in doing and seeing how we can we can cross that 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 bridge or or that gap. Another area that that has to do with that that I'm very interested in is all the the interactions and the interconnections that we can have in translation. Translation. In my opinion, that's what makes it very appealing to me, is that it's very easy to connect the practice with the theory, with the teaching. I mean, and when I say it's very easy, it doesn't what happen. Say, what my students say about theory, yeah. I don't know. That's yeah, just, but that's because I do believe that the that people have been in their own separate areas. So we've had the teachers, who sometimes are professionals, who sometimes are academics, uh, and sometimes they're you know, they're teachers. And uh, then we have the researchers. And again, here we, we have some connections that should not be very difficult to make, but people have not been investing the time and the effort in making those connections. When we compare with other areas like that I'm familiar with, like second language acquisition, like uh, recently heritage language teaching, if we could follow the model of those areas in translation, I mean, that's something I'm very interested in and putting out there as a suggestion and, and trying to contribute to myself. Because we look at those fields 
And if they've done it, in translation, we can do it even better because of the nature of the field. There, is, there should be more of a connection between the practice and the theory to get informed practice and at the same time teaching that is informed by both the theory and the practice. In second language acquisition, heritage language teaching, the practice part, well, is used in the language. But in our case, we have all the practitioners. We have all the people that are actually doing it out there that could really help with the teaching. And at the same time, the people who are doing all the research could inform that teaching. So those connections. Now, if you look, again, I was talking about how we know we do SLA and, and, and uh, second language acquisition and uh, heritage language teaching. If you look at those models, what happens in those fields? Well, we have a community of researchers that study how people acquire a second language or how um, learning a language that is a heritage language, something that has been learned at home versus the classroom, how those people learn the languages, they study the theory, they study the, the, the research and the empirical aspects of it, and then the findings of that get transferred into certain types of methodologies. It could be better or worse, but people can argue on the basis of that research, and then the teachers use them. Okay, so. That's a model that's been out there. It's not perfect. There's always some people in the field that may not be as well informed as others. But I, I do believe that we can definitely do something like that with translation. And then if on top of that, you know, we try to connect with the language community, because obviously language competence and language proficiency is a big part of translation. Although for many years we've tried to say, oh, you know, that's not part of it because the translator needs to know it. it needs to be a perfect bilingual. But the reality of it is that Many people are not, and many of the students we have in our classrooms are not. Also, it'd be important for us to try to get some of those students earlier in their careers, even if they're not perfectly bilingual, to know about translation, understand how it works, and kind of develop that along the same lines they're developing their bilingualism. Sometimes I've come across students who are perfectly, I mean, they're perfect bilinguals, but when it comes to translation, you tell them to translate. Just start doing things that you would never think that they do. I truly believe that's because they don't really understand translation very well, especially in this country that has such a monolingual, the U.S., such a monolingual tradition, right? Even when they know two languages, they don't quite understand what's going on. If we got them earlier to understand about translation, to understand what they need to know and where they are, you know, along that continuum, I think that would help. So that's okay. another area that I'm very interested in. Well, and I've, yeah. We'll come back to the rest. Sonia, I okay. want to know how you got here. You, you're coming from a linguistic background then? Uh-huh. Okay, go back to your 20s. You're starting doctoral research. You're looking for a topic. Uh-huh. What, what country are you in? Well, before, uh, well, I was here. you're not from the United no, States. No, I'm not from the United States. I'm from Spain, okay. and that's where I got my BA, or and then, you know, be licenciatura in mm -hmm. Spain in English. Then I came... In, in Galicia? In English in Santiago de Compostela. Santiago, all right, yeah. Good. So then I came to the United States in 87 so to do a master's degree in applied linguistics. Once I did that, and my interest even then was I wanted to do translation. So after that, I was in my mid-20s, actually, after I finished that degree, then I was in Binghamton. Binghamton University oh, okay. working with Marilyn Rose. Well, that's literary translation. Exactly. I was, to yeah, I was accepted into the PhD mm -hmm. program, Comparative okay. Literature and Translation Studies, because I wanted to do translation. Okay, with my MA, that was impossible in linguistics. So I said, okay, I want to do translation. Um, so when I got there, you know, I really wanted to do translation, but comparative literature was not quite what I wanted to do for a PhD. I saw myself more of as a linguist. So I still wanted to do translation. There were not too many options in this country back then. Now we have a number of PhDs in Kent State. We have Binghamton, too, as a PhD in translation studies back then in Ham. So then what I decided to do was that I was just uh, going to get my MA in translation studies, get my education in translation, and then go get a PhD in linguistics and hopefully be able to combine the two of them. Mm -hmm. uh, so then what I did is I got my uh, MA in Comparative Literature and Translation Studies, got the graduate certificates that Binghamton had then in translation, the different combinations, you know, uh, literary translation and scientific, non-literary, English, Spanish, Spanish, English, and all those things. I don't know if they still have those, but anyway, that's what you know I did back then. And then I got my PhD in Spanish Linguistics, trying to From then Illinois, University Illinois, okay. of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, 
trying to use some of, of what I was learning in some of my linguistics courses. A lot of them um, um, really have to do with my interest in pedagogy and translation and trying to compare with second language acquisition because I did a number of courses having to do with second language acquisition and methodology and how to teach a language. So of course my thinking was, well, we can do the same thing with translation. So I was trying to apply that, all of that, discourse analysis and a number of other courses that had to do with linguistics in general, but I was doing my projects and my interests were all in, in, in translation. Okay. So, so that's... In, in this, you, you've had an academic, a straight academic career in the United States. Well, not so. really. I mean, yeah. mostly. Have but you been a professional I, translator? Yes. Ah, okay. Yes. When I was, uh, in addition to all the freelancing that everyone does, mm -hmm. I had some time off in between my MA in Binghamton when I finished um, the MA in translation studies. No, actually, in computer literature with a, concentr a track mm -hmm. in translation studies. So that's what they call it then. I got a job as a full-time in-house translator with Xerox in upstate New York. Okay. So I did that for a year working with Sistran with uh, post-editing yeah, and coding and use. scientific. Okay. Yeah. So. I did that right before uh, going into my PhD, and then of course I continued doing freelancing. Um, every throughout my career, throughout my education, and also the jobs that I've that I've had, I've always tried to combine linguistics with translation. So there's mm -hmm. always been departments that were not interested in translation per se, but that they could use it. And sometimes okay. they were not interested in it. They, they didn't know that they were. So I had to do the convincing, and I always managed to get a course here and there. When I was a PhD student at Illinois, I started the first course that they had in translation. The course had been in the books forever, but they never had anyone to teach it because they were not going to go hire someone in translation to do that yeah. at that time, 15 years ago. So I so said, I can do this. I have this background. I've worked as a, as a translator, so I can do that. So I, I did that. One final question. There's not a lot of translation research in the United States, mm -hmm. um, but it seems, the question is, are you working with people in Canada and Europe? Do you feel you're a part of a wider community, or is there specifically American community here, an academic community? There's a, there's a clear academic community in this country. Yeah. I mean, we have a TISA, you know, there's EST in Europe, but we have a TISA here. And there's there's and a cats in the United States in, in, in Canada, but in obviously at least I'm very involved and you know being vice president, mm. you know being also part of the the, the scientific committee every other year with at least looking at what people the types of abstracts that they submit. So there is a scientific committee mm. uh, community in the United States. It's much smaller and much younger than it is in Europe. Um, also, what happens is it's in the United States there are a lot of people who are doing translation related uh, research. They don't know too much about translation. Translation is a field, or is that TISA? So we do have to do a lot of, a lot of publicity and advertising, and say, hey, you know, we're here. You know, this is completely relevant to what you're doing. You're not entirely aware that we're there, but uh, but it is important. We find a lot of, uh, not a lot, but you know, we find people that come somewhat you know, in a similar way to the field that that I did, even much more recently than I did, because they're doing work in translation. But they may have. Uh, PhDs in applied linguistics and SLAT, obviously also in comparative literature and all kinds of related, not all kinds obviously, but some related degrees in literary studies. That's much more the tradition in the United States. But we find, for instance, we have a, a second language acquisition and teaching program here that has graduated a number of people that are doing work in translation, mm -hmm. translation studies. You know, Holly Jacobson who's a graduate of SLAP program here is doing that kind of work. After her, I think her PhD is 2002. We've had a number of them. This program is not a PhD in translation studies, and obviously the majority of the, their graduates do apply linguistics, do second language acquisition. But some of the graduates who came with an interest in translation, because some of them had MAs from translation uh, schools and other places, uh, those people have developed their research in, in that area. Why? Because they're given the research tools that they need and then they apply it to translation. Okay. So, yeah. So, Sonia, I hope this video gets people interested in Atisa yeah. and yeah. translation studies in the United and States. And this kind of work and, and okay. you know, I'll be happy anyone who's interested in this type of work, you know, that has to do with second language acquisition, with translation studies. I work with translation quality too. Please feel free to get in touch okay. with me. Thank you very much, Sonia. Thank you. Thank you.